And some people said, well, let's look at it even more intently. What happens if there are four dimensions of space? It still breaks. Five, six, seven, eight still breaks. But you get to a total of 10 space-time dimensions, and all of a sudden, the math falls into place. So that's where this strange idea that there may be more dimensions of space than the ones that we know about comes from. And frankly, I and many others have spent the, the most of my career trying to figure out where those extra dimensions are, what their features look like, and perhaps what implications they might have for physics that we can see in the world around us. Now, in fact, of course, one of the big... Um, it's interesting. This, when this idea first came up, the idea of extra dimensions, there, early in the century, in the last century, there was, it was developed independently by a mathematician and a physicist. And the mathematician said, well, you know, you can have these consistent extra dimensions that do interesting things. But, but the physicist rightly said, okay, if, they're, if they are there, how come we don't see them? Yeah. And, uh, and the original idea was that, that they were extremely small. So they're so small you can't see them. Maybe you want to elaborate on that. Sure. Uh, so the gentleman you're referring to, Kaluza, way back in 1919, was basically studying Einstein's general theory of relativity, which had been so successful at describing the force of gravity. And the language that Einstein used was unfamiliar. He used the language of curved space, in fact, curved space-time as the medium for mediating the force of gravity. So right now, according to Einstein, I'm sort of feeling myself being pulled down because my body wants to slide down an indentation in the curved space-time that the Earth creates. So it's an unfamiliar idea, but a powerful one. Kaluza looked at it and said, well, that's interesting. What if the other forces of nature, namely the electromagnetic force, also can be described in that language of curved space? But the problem was Einstein had used up all, right. all of the known dimensions of space. So Kaluza said, maybe there's another dimension of space, and maybe ripples and curves in that would describe the electromagnetic force. And he did the math, and lo and behold, the equation for electricity and magnetism popped out by the simple assumption of one more dimension of space. But then the question is, where is it? And, you know, I think it is interesting. Don't you think, though, that, that it's sort of an interesting differentiation between mathematics and physics? So he was just perfectly happy with that and didn't bother to ask the next question. And it was, it was uh, Klein, the, the physicist, who then asked it. And it was Einstein, too. Yeah, or, you know, true. So, I mean, at least as the story goes, Kluge sends that paper yeah, to right. Einstein. And Einstein, at first, is very excited about this because he himself was fixated on unifying the description of all forces, not yeah. just gravity. So he loved this idea that by having one more dimension of space, you could put together electricity, magnetism, and gravity in one framer. Wow, that was just what he was looking for. But then, like you say, he said, hold on, this is crazy. We only have three dimensions of space, so this can't possibly be the right way to go. He thinks about it for another year or two, holding up publication of this paper, yeah, exactly. much to the consternation of Kaluza, Yeah. And finally, Einstein says, yeah, maybe this is possible. But it was Oscar Klein who really then came along and said, well, here's how to think about it. There can be more dimensions of space as long as they're really small. The ones we know about are big. We can really see all these dimensions because they're large. But imagine there's a tiny, curled up, crumpled up dimension that's so small that we don't see it. And in this particular case, they imagine if you had a little tiny additional circular dimension all around us, the image that I like to use is, imagine you're looking at a carpet from far away. It looks flat. But then you put your eye right down on it, and you see these little tiny loops, these little pieces of thread called the pile, I guess. So you see these little tiny circular pieces attached to the carpet, extra dimensions curled up. You don't see them from far away. The idea was maybe that's true of our universe, extra curled up dimensions all around us, so small that we don't see them. Okay, so, that's, so that explains why we don't see them, but of course, the, the, there it is over there. Thank okay. you. The, uh, the job of physics is not to explain why we don't see things, of course, but to, but to test the ideas and explain how we can see them, or at least how we can tell yeah. that they might exist. Um, well, maybe you should talk a little bit about the challenge. And one of the, one of the reasons that string theory uh, is, is, is at this point uh, has, has not yet sort of made touch with, with experiments. So maybe you should talk about that a little bit. Yes, and I think, you know, jumping off from the historical line is not a bad way to go because after Kaluza and Klein suggested this idea of an extra dimension, 
they did try to see yeah. if it could make contact with experiment, and they found that, for instance, it was very hard, almost impossible, to get the electron, a known particle of matter, they couldn't incorporate it successfully into the theory. And that was largely why this idea was ultimately dropped by yeah. the 1940s. Then string theory came along in the 80s, and it didn't just allow for extra dimensions, it required extra dimensions. I, actually, it was, I think it is interesting to point out that we actually really came along in the sort of, at least the 60s, the, the, the yep. 60s yep. where it was first used to try and explain another Good force point. of nature. Yep. And, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm, and maybe, it, it's an interesting question. Neither you or I were practicing physicists then, but at that time, uh, I don't think you were anyway. Um, at that time. Oh, speak for yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, at that time, it wasn't 10 dimensions, it was 26. Yeah. And I'm a, I, I was amazed when I've when I sort of gone back and looked at that stuff to think that people, that the questions were so desperate that people would be willing to accept not, not six or seven extra dimensions, but 22 extra dimensions. And, and uh, may, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about why it would be that physicists would, would sort of be willing to make that incredible leap. Yes, so you're right. The earlier, the earliest version of string theory, I should say, did require 22 extra yeah. dimensions yeah. for this total of 26 if you include time. And I think the reason people were willing to take it seriously is twofold. One, there had been so many attempts to put gravity and quantum mechanics together and they all failed. They all just broke down. So when an approach came along which seemed to work but required something weird and yet that weirdness was something that had already been contemplated in one form or another decades earlier in some sense, people said, well, you know, whether it's one extra dimension or two or five or 22, it's the idea getting over the notion that this is all that there is. Once you allow for more dimensions, the actual number doesn't seem to really sway you much one way or yeah, another. Yeah, I mean, if you got a bunch of extra. But I was actually thinking yeah. of going back. I think yeah. it, it's interesting to me that even in the 1960s where they weren't talking about gravity, they were talking about uh, another force which wasn't so profound at uh, that time. Yeah. Uh, there was just a big problem. Accelerators kept coming up with or particles. new particles, and there yep. were particles everywhere, and they, the zoo was growing, and it appeared there was no order. That, that when, people, when, when, this, when people came up with an idea that they thought might provide order, they were willing to at least explore this idea. That's exactly right. And, and I think it's, uh, it, it represents the fact that it's not, and we'll ask you about, I, one of the things I want to ask you is if you really think there are those extra dimensions in a moment, but, but I th it, the idea of, of exploring them and using that hypothesis and seeing where it goes without becoming religiously devoted to it, I think is interesting, is that you're willing to try anything to see if it works. And then, and in the case of the 1980s, what they discovered, well, it didn't, they had the right solution but asked the wrong question, at least they hoped they, they had. So That's exactly right. So the earlier version of string theory was not trying to resolve this incompatibility between quantum mechanics and gravity. Strangely enough, the earlier version of string theory, as you say, was trying to describe data that was coming out of accelerators worldwide that were finding this whole slew of particles, the zoo that you mentioned a moment ago, this whole slew of particles without any order. And string theory in its earlier version seemed to supply an order. All these particles now being thought of as different vibrations of the string gave an organizing principle for thinking about this wealth of data. The problem was there was one pesky particle that came out of the mathematics of string theory that was not found in the accelerators. It was a particle that people a few years later recognized as just the kind of particle that you would need if this was a theory embracing gravity, a particle known as a graviton. So people said, let's take a big step back, reevaluate this theory, not just think of it as a theory that describes the particles, and footnote, another theory had come along which did a better job at that, quantum chromodynamics. And two of the people who won the Nobel Prize for it are at this um, That's right. meeting right now, in fact. So people said, let's not try to answer that question, which that other theory does better anyway. Let's take this vice of this graviton particle, make it a virtue. Think of this now as a theory uniting gravity and quantum mechanics. Actually, it's interesting you talked about this vice and virtue. I, it may not be a secret to many of you that Brian and I have appeared on stage a number of times in a different, in a more combative format, a debating string theory, which we're not going to do today because I won the other ones. Uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, no.